Okay, welcome to the book salon, and I'm Clay Carson, and happy to be here. Uh, this is new for me, too, so if it's new for you and you're having trouble uh, hearing my voice, you might consider putting on a head headset. Um, we're here as part of the book salon to discuss um, a wonderful novel, and um, I think that for me it has special meaning because um, I think the immigrant experience and the migrant experience is one of the most interesting and now one of the most um, widely shared experiences in the world. Uh, so many people are moving from one place to another to try to um, pursue opportunities and maybe because of necessity. And this book, I think, has, has a lot to say about um, the re, uh, reality of that experience and, and what we need to learn from it. Um, I will just start by answering the questions that uh, have been posted for me. And uh, I'm sure you'll have others, but uh, these are the ones that uh, are here now. So how much does the reader's race affect his or her ability to identify with the characters? Well, I, I think one of the things ab about that is that I hope it makes people think about race identity to begin with. How do we know what race we are? And, and I hope that what we get is a much more complex notion of what race can mean. Uh, reading her book, you begin to understand that we simplify that so much. And uh, so I think that the ability to identify, one of the things you're identifying with is that struggle that many of us go through in terms of, of deciding what racial identity we have and which one is applied to by other people uh, for us. Um, so I think that uh, that's one of the advantages of, of reading this, is that it helps us understand as a reader um, how race affects us. The female advocates color blindness as racism, the new racism in America. What do you think about that? Uh, okay, this is a question that uh, really gets to one of the main points of the book, um, and that is that no one is really colorblind. You know, if they are, they probably should go to a doctor and get their eyes checked. Because if you're not noticing that people come in different colors and that those signify other things about their background, then you're not noticing what's going on around you. And I think what we see, you know, that whole term of colorblindness and whether we live in a colorblind society, uh, I think reflects that for many people, the fact that for many people, they don't want to be concerned about color differences and that it's not necessary for them to do that. I, I think for, uh, for someone from a minority background, it, it's, it's always necessary to be aware of color. Uh, what does Adenzi's time in Great Britain do to deepen, or not, Adishi's primary message of race disparities in predominantly white cultures? Well, I, I think that that's one of that section of the book is, is one of the most interesting and one of the most challenging. And um, for a book that has many light parts, this is a more heavy um, experience uh, because it shows how the immigrant experience can be quite harsh, uh, forcing an immigrant to do things that would not otherwise be conceivable because you're desperate. And, um, and, and I think that it shows again the complexity because um, Odenzi, while he's going through his difficulties in Great Britain, other people from Nigeria in Great Britain are doing well. And uh, so you, you see that, um, that class plays a, a factor and that we can be different, have different class identities at different times in our life. Uh, many of us have been through uh, poverty of the 20s when you're a student, um, only to come out as more affluent. So we, we I think we need to understand uh, that as 
one of the things that affects racial disparities. In what ways does this thread of a story also bring out the extra challenge that black men face in a white-dominated culture? Well, um, I think it brings out the way in which men and women uh, face challenges, and they're distinctive. I don't know if I would call it extra uh, challenge for black men, because uh, the challenges that she faces, especially when she's poor, uh, are also quite, um, well, they're, they're challenging. They they're, uh, force her to do things that she would not ordinarily do. And I think that's one of the most uh, horrific aspects of the, of the novel. In your audio interview, you mentioned that your daughter-in-law has a similar experience uh, to Euphemia's. How are their stories similar and different? Well, first of all, my daughter-in-law her experience is mostly outside of Nigeria. In fact, it's nearly all outside of Nigeria because she was taken, uh, her parents came from Nigeria during the, uh, the war, um, the uh, Biafran War, and they settled in Canada. So her, her native culture is, is really Nigerian Canadian. And then she came here to Stanford to play volleyball and, and to be a student here. So um, so I think, you know, clearly it's a, a very different experience. And, and I think that illustrates that simply saying someone is a Nigerian em immigrant or the child of Nigerian immigrants, their stories could be very, very different. And, and uh, Barbara's story is, is quite different. Which of Vichy's observations of the contrast between living in Nigeria and living in the USA are particularly illuminating? Well, I, I think that what she emphasizes is the way in which an outsider notices things, um, particularly about language. And I think a lot of the book is about language, about the way in which we speak and the, you know, um, for all of us, uh, the words we use have um, subjective meanings, um, meanings that uh, relate to our cultural background. And, and even though um, a, an Im immigrant from Nigeria would be uh, facile in, in English, it's a different kind of English than what is used in the United States, just as when you go to Britain, you find, or South Africa, or Australia you find that um, there's lots of differences in the way in which English is used. And a, a lot of that has to do with class also. Discuss the title of the book, Americana. What does that, this book mean to you? Well, one of the things that happens in the book is that you, you understand that Americana has lots of different meanings. And it changes its meaning as you read on in the book. And you find that for um, for the main character as she returns to Nigeria, Americana can be a pejorative term. It can be uh, a put down. It can, and when she's talking to another other Nigerians in the United States, it can be a way of of, of putting her down. And uh, so I think that that um, it's it's interesting that when you try to become American, and I think that the title refers to that process of becoming an American and how sometimes that is a difficult process and you don't quite get there. And, and the fact and that term Americana captures that. The makeup of black students at Stanford has changed over time with a greater percentage of students from Africa. Have you seen your students have similar experiences? Have you seen your students have similar experiences found in the book? Yes, very much so. And I, you know, I mentioned my um, my daughter-in-law and other students I've I've had um, from Nigeria, Kenya, and uh, the Caribbean also, and all of them come with different perspectives. And and I think that 
what this does is um, played out in the book in the contrast between being African living in America and being African American and the way in which the term African American has been taken as um, the, the preferred term for black Americans who were born in the United States. And it has very little to do with Africa, and it has a lot to do with, uh, with America. And, uh, and I think that when they come here and then um, you see how when students arrive here from a, another country and they're black, they immediately become black in the American sense of the term because that's the way they're perceived by other students and they're counted that way. But they're not really in the same category. And, and I think that that's, uh, that this book should be read by uh, African-American students because it, uh, I think it helps to explain some of the tensions and differences uh, between um, black students who have come from other predominantly black nations. Can, can you talk about how issues around class play out in the book? Well, I think class is, is, is certainly one of the, the most important issues in the book. Um, what happens is that Nigerian identity is, of course, shaped by class. And um, the main characters in the book are middle, middle class Nigerians. And so their experiences are going to be very different from uh, working class and, and poor Nigerians who would never even think about, uh, uh, well, they might think about it, but it's not very likely that they're going to be able to, to leave. And, um, and of course, that plays out in the United States. We see how issues of class, one of the things that I think is true is that in the United States, Race sometimes overwhelms class in the sense that we're so aware of race in the United States that we don't notice class as much as it might be the case in either an all-black uh, or predominantly black nation like Nigeria or in a predominantly white nation um, like Great Britain or France. There, the class issues are much more noticeable because race isn't in the forefront all the time. And, um, and, and in the United States, we tend to, to um, discount the importance of class. And I, and I think that that's unfortunate because I think class plays a major role in American society. And, and, um, and, and yet, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. You know, if you ask most Americans of almost whatever background, they would say they're middle class. Well, what does that mean? You know, are you working class? Are you, uh, do you are you rich? Are you affluent? Um, you know, it, the the middle class tends to get very a very large um, category that you know, most of us prefer to put ourselves in. Uh, so therefore, we don't really pay much attention to the differences um, that are getting played out in this economic crisis we're going through between upper middle class people and working class people who hold on um, the low, lower middle class is very tenuous. Uh, another way of putting that is uh, people who are one missed paycheck away from poverty. In the online discussion, it was mentioned that America was not necessarily a melting pot, but rather a salad where immigrants maintain their cultural identity. Well, maybe we need to think about, is there something between melting pot and salad? Um, the melting pot idea was came out of a time when to be an American really meant a Native American um, from Europe, European background. And that was the norm. And then 
the idea of the melting pot was that immigrants would come in, they would be all mixed together in this melting pot, and they would come marching out with uh, little American flags, and they would now be Americans. Well, we know now that, that um, some people didn't mix, and uh, race played a, a major role in that, and, and that even after 100 years, the salad metaphor gets to that these differences that still divide American society. But I think that we need to see how immigrants do change, and that that change is sometimes painful, and sometimes we have a situation where the second, the, the generation that, that comes to America might have a different perspective about melting in, blending in, than the second generation, or even the third generation, who might want to recapture some of the, uh, the older identity. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's a complex process. And, uh, and you know, maybe, well, whenever we look at a, at a metaphor, it doesn't always apply to every situation. And, and certainly, um, you know, there, there's got to be other metaphors that, that capture that complexity. How do you think the U.S. is portrayed in the, in the book? Well, I don't think of the book as portraying the U.S. as a country. Um, she really looks at a small portion of it. She's really looking at types of Americans. Um, in the book, I think, I think one of the weaker parts of the book is that because she's only selecting out a few types, um, Hurt, um, the first boyfriend, um, Blaine, the second boyfriend. Uh, you know, the, to me, they. I don't know if I really believe the characters as as much as I haven't encountered people who are quite this stereotypical. Um, Kimberly, uh, the white woman she she works for, I think similarly seems um, overly stereotyped. But, uh, but perhaps that's because I'm looking at it from the perspective of someone uh, who's grown up in American society, so I don't think it's, it's as accurate as she might actually feel as an outsider coming in and saying, well, you just don't want to admit that you're an American stereotype. Because you know, from my perspective as the main character, she might see us as, as stereotypical. So, so I don't think the country is being portrayed, but I think Americans are being portrayed in, in various ways. Why is it important to have an African writer's perspective on race in America? Well, I think it's always important to have an outsider's perspective. Um, Alexis de, de Tocqueville, um, when he did his, wrote his book, um, Democracy in America, uh, had a lot of interesting, uh, as a French writer coming into the United States had a lot of interesting perspectives about 19th century America that might not have been noticeable by an American. As I said, one of the things that we, we have is that race is, is the big demar um, demarcating factor in American society. Um, you know, when, when on the news, if you want to identify a crime sub sub uh, suspect, race is always used almost as the first term. A white male or a black male. Um, and so it, it's, it's always front and center. We don't say a working class white person um, is the suspect. Um, you know, that, and that aspect of race is something that I think an outsider who might, from an American perspective, be the same race as black Americans, um, to understand that that person is coming in with a perspective that has very little to do with American slavery and, and, uh, and a lot to do with, might have more in common with an immigrant from India. Um, than with uh, someone 
of the same race in America. So I think it's, it, it is very important to have an African writer's perspective. And I'm very glad we have this book um, to use as a way of looking at our own society. After coming to America, Ifemalu hides her Nigerian accent only to pick it back up again later. What do you think the author means by sharing this? Well, one of the things is maybe calling attention to the fact that many of us use um, accent as a way of shifting identity, uh, of playing roles. Uh, I, I know for many African Americans, um, to talk black is something that you can perform if you need to, if you want to. But you could also do standard English if you want to. And, um, and you, you use whatever is appropriate or useful at, at the time. And I think that's what she's doing, is that she, you know, it's, it's clear from the book that she would talk in a different way to other Nigerians than she would to Americans. And and that's going to change over the course of the book also as she becomes more familiar with the, with the language. And, and, uh, and I think that that's one of the fun things about the book is that it, it plays a lot of interesting games with language and the way we speak and the way we use terms. And, and, and I, I think that that's one of the most fascinating things in the book. Many of Ifimula's blog posts are brutally honest. Yes, they are. Uh, why is Ifemalu's blog so successful? What do you think of her posts? Well, I think one of, they're one of the highlights of the book. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder, though, whether uh, if she was were actually using her blog posts or went back to some of her blog posts and, and rewrote them for the, for the book. Um, they're much better written than, than and much more concisely written than most blogs that I read, I, I'm not so sure that uh, uh, the question of why is it so successful, I'm not sure it, it ever would be that successful. Um, you know, maybe at the time when, when she was writing a blog, it was easier for a blog to become um, phenomenally successful the way she describes it. That probably would not be the case today. There's so many blogs around, and uh, it it's really takes a lot of time and effort and, and, and self-promotion to get successful. So uh, I, I like them a lot, and I think that uh, it's um, they, they almost serve as, as um, the features of the book that, um, that allow her to, to uh, make some larger comments as she uh, as departures from her what is really basically a love story. Is hair a useful way of examining race and culture? I, rem I remember talking with um, with uh, one of my colleagues in, in the history department, um, Camille Jackson, who was uh, talking about writing a book about African American hair or black hair. And um, I remember thinking, you know, after I, had, I hadn't heard of anyone else uh, trying to do this. It was, it was maybe 20 years ago. And, and it, I realized that it was a, a very interesting idea. And probably if you got any group of African Americans together, they could talk for hours about hair as something that is had significance in, in, in their lives. And probably for black women, even more so. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting way of examining race, what we mean by race. Um, I know I've been to Brazil and, and studied um, Brazilian history. And, and a lot of their dis uh, words to describe race have to do with hair texture and hair color. And so it becomes a way of distinguishing um, your race. And, and she uses that in the book as, as a way of distinguishing herself 
that she's she's very comfortable wearing at, at some point in the book, uh, wearing her hair naturally in, in a way that African American women might, for class reasons, say that that's that's not a useful way of moving up in the world. Um, so so it does get into race, class, and culture. How is the dilemma of being an undocumented worker handled in the book? Well, I think this is another one of the highlights of the book because you know, this being an undocumented, uh, certainly here in Palo Alto, here at Stanford, we see we see that, but we don't really see it. We we kind of notice that the people doing the construction in, in this town are um, probably many of them are undocumented. People washing our dishes and working in various menial roles are undocumented. But we don't want to get into how difficult that is and, and the choices that they have to make and, and the, um, the way in which this is the human rights uh, crisis of our time. Because uh, you know, if you think about whose human rights are being um, violated and, and are certainly not respected, it's those without documentation who are trying to pursue opportunities um, similar to the ones that my parents and grandparents tried to pursue, but they didn't have to cross a border to go north. Uh, so I think that this is uh, a major concern of mine, and I, and I think it is a major human rights issue in the world. Do you think the story could have been set in another time period, or does it only work for modern times? Oh, of course, yeah. The, the immigrant uh, story has been going on for all of modern times. Um, it has become almost a, the normal story. You know, we think of, of um, pursuing opportunity by leaving, and, and we might not cross a border, but we go to another place. Um, and you know, how many people from the rural south are now living in the urban north? Uh, so, so all of these stories are. You know these comedy of manners, or I guess they could be called, but they're sometimes very tragic and very painful stories. And I think we need to know more about them. Do you have any other recommendations for readers who enjoyed Americana? Well, first of all, I should say that I get my recommendations from my wife and other women, and that's usually what I read when I go on retreat and in, in the spring and try to get my own writing done. Um, one book that I read last spring was um, Signature of All Things, um, Melissa Gilbert's um, book, um, which I thought was fascinating about a woman scientist in the 19th century. And also, while I was while I was there, I, I worked on a book, um, Ken Follett's um, latest book, um, his his uh, End of Eternity, which uh, has to do. It's the, it's the third book in a trilogy looking at the world of the 20, 20th century, and um, I, uh, you know, I'd never really done this for a novelist or, or serving as a consultant, but uh, I found it fascinating. It forced me to read 3,000 words of his uh, trilogy while on my um, retreat, but I learned a lot from it, and uh, and I and I think it's a, it's a it's a good, really interesting book. Um, but uh, as I said, I, uh, when I go on retreat next time, I'll, I'll call on my women friends who tend to read more books than us men, and particularly the kinds of books I like to read on retreat, which are not American history books, but, uh, but novels. Well, um, I think we've reached the end. Um, I thank you very much. This has uh, been a good experience for me. Um, I'm Still thinking about putting um, my course on on the web, so this will be good practice for me as I try to do that. Thank you so much. Shalom.